Welcome to Shape by Faith with your host, Teresa Rowe. To find out more about Shape by Faith and Teresa Rowe, please visit shapebyfaith.com or visit the YouTube channel, Facebook, or Instagram. And now, here is Teresa Rowe. Welcome to Shape by Faith, where we shape our bodies and hearts for God's purposes. I have an amazing guest. And by the way, happy Heart Month, everyone. Lori Ann and Lori Ann Wood was on my show back in October of last year, and she has an incredible story to share. And I thought she would be amazing for Heart Month or just any month. Um, Lori Ann, she lives with her husband in an empty nest in beautiful Bentonville, Arkansas. So Lori discovered a serious heart condition almost too late, and Lori can explain that. So she writes to encourage others to explore their difficult faith questions along the detours of life, and her book is called Divine Detour. But welcome back to Shape by Faith, Lori. Thank you, Teresa. It's so great to be back. Yes, um, you have an incredible story, and, and God's hand is definitely all over you, on your life. And um, I'm so thankful that our paths have crossed. But let's let's get to your story. Um, I want to ask you if, if you noticed any type of heart symptoms um, early in your life. You know, I, I can look back and think that I did notice some things that weren't quite right with me 10 or 15 years ago, but I didn't know that they were heart related. They were just some things that I explained as something else. So I didn't notice anything that really raised a red flag and said, I need to get my heart checked out. But I knew that some things weren't quite the way they should be. Mm. Things are a little different for females compared to males when it comes to the heart, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like some of the symptoms Mm -hmm. are a little bit different. Um, Mm -hmm. and I could say the same thing, you know, when I was growing up, of course I had no clue anything was going on with the heart. So you had some of those sneaky symptoms for years. So what were they? And did you think any of them were serious enough to consult a doctor? I did not see them as serious because I think as women, sometimes we make excuses or find a a different reason for things. And that's what I was doing with some of these symptoms because it it never entered my mind that it could be heart related. I didn't have any family history. I didn't have any risk factors. And like you said, it's not the first thing people think of for women that something like shortness of breath or inability to exercise would immediately be heart. And I think that's changing a little bit, but it's it's still difficult for someone to get there right away because we think of menopause, you know, we think of just being out of shape or not getting enough sleep like we should, not prioritizing our health. And so we can explain some of these symptoms and the ones that I first notice were really sneaky. Um, They were, you know, I I mentioned inability to exercise. I tried to run a couch to 5k one time because I was just in a position where I thought I'm the one in my family that's out of shape. My husband runs marathons. My kids were in high school sports. And so this inability I had to exercise, I thought was just that I was out of shape. And I was determined to try to get back into it, and I couldn't even get past day two on Couch to 5K. And if you've ever done one of those, you know they start out really, really easy, uh, but it, it I couldn't do it. Um, I so also, what, what do you mean by that, Lord, that you, could, you, you couldn't do it? Yeah. Like, what was going on with your body? Well... I couldn't, like, I I think the first day, it literally means couch to 5K. (laughs) And the first day, I think, was basically, you know, walk to the mailbox and back or maybe jog to the mailbox and back. And I, I did that. And then the next day, it maybe went a little bit further than that. And going, you know, 50 yards, 100 yards and trying to get back home, I couldn't do it in just a real easy jog. And I'm, I've am i always been super healthy. And I thought I somewhere along the line, I had really lost my 
physical conditioning is what I was thinking. And there was another one maybe that probably should have tipped me off even more is that I had a very difficult time with inclines. And that was, I noticed it when we'd be on vacation, sometimes when we would be walking places where there was an incline that I wasn't expecting. And my family would say, mom, I think there might be something you need to get checked out. And I was like, no, I'm just, you guys are in shape. I'm not, or, you know, I'm, it's the phase of life I'm in and I didn't go get it checked out. I had a shortness of breath that I just felt like I couldn't get enough air in my lungs when I was doing just normal things. Uh, I, I taught college business classes for 25 years and I got to a point where I couldn't stand up there and talk for that, for, a, you know, an hour, an hour and a half lecture. I just couldn't do it. And even then it never occurred to me that something was going on with my heart. I thought maybe I had some secondhand smoke from my childhood. I didn't know, but it, the heart never came into, into consideration for me. You know, it's funny how, women kind of reason things out <laughs> where yes. men just dismiss them completely. Don't think a thought about them. <laughs> and mm-hmm. women were like, well, it could be this could be that. And that's what we do. Um, mm-hmm. I want, I want you to address how important it is to listen to the warning signals in your body. Mm-hmm. It is, I can say it is probably one of the most important things that I didn't do if I were talking to my a younger version of myself, one of the symptoms that I had, I didn't know I had, was a constant dry cough. And I was explaining these to my kids after my diagnosis and just saying, you know, these are the symptoms in case it turns out to be you know, genetic that you need to be looking for inability to exercise, difficulty with incline, shortness of breath, fatigue. And I got, and I said, there's another one I don't have. It's constant dry cough. And my youngest daughter said, mom, you've always had a constant dry cough because when we would lose you in a store, that's how we'd find you. We'd just wait for you to cough. Oh wow! And that was not, if I was aware of it, I was totally ignoring it. But when we're talking about listening to the warning signals in your body, I think sometimes it's important to listen to the warning signs that the people closest to you are saying, you know, something Mm. might not be right because we're blinded to them. A lot of times we've gotten so used to them that we don't even know they're there. That is so true. That is so true. And, and you, and you just get used to living like that. Like with your dry cough, you didn't even notice it. <laughs> it right, was just part right. of you. Um, it was. And I, and I can see kind of explaining, well, I'm out of shape and, you know, I'm not working out. And so no wonder I'm, I'm breathless. But I, I would also think those standing up in front of college students, not being able to stand up, that, that would be a little frightening, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you had to sit down. Um, so, uh, I, I think that would be a, a big warning signal. So what about, okay, your story, and I'd love for you to get into that in this second segment, um, that we'll go into, but, um, the warning signs and the symptoms, um, for heart failure, uh, that may be mistaken for something else. Is there anything else you've named a lot mm. of those? Well, there's several and, Some of them that I think we mistake for something else is like if we have weight gain, I I had some weight gain, even though I wasn't, I didn't think I'd change my eating habits or anything else. And it turned out to be just fluid retention around my heart. They drained 14 pounds of fluid from me initially when I was hospitalized. And I just thought that 14 pounds was, you know, I'd kind of let myself go. So we can listen to other people and think, oh, it's menopause. Oh, it's, you know, being out of shape or it's not getting enough sleep. And that's, I think, where we can just rationalize it and and excuse it. But when we look at all those little symptoms put together, they become this huge, huge thing 
whereas individually they just seem so insignificant. That's right. Well, let's take a real quick break, and I can't wait to get into your story more. So everyone stay tuned for more Shape by Faith coming up next. Welcome back to Shape by Faith, where we shape our bodies and hearts for God's purposes. My guest is Lori Ann Wood, and she's talking about her heart and her experience. Um, Lori, why is it so important to be completely honest with your doctor about your symptoms, even if they feel unimportant? For my, in my case, I think the the thing that my doctor said, which kind of stung a little bit when we finally did figure out that I had this heart failure diagnosis, he, he said, if it's diagnosed early, you have a much better outcome. And I was already at end stage heart failure when he noticed that. And he was our family doctor who had delivered our my babies. He had, ta- you know, he didn't even know my parents, but he knew their family history. He just was one of those old fashioned doctors that did everything. And he felt so bad when he found, when I went in to see him and he took a chest x ray and he found this extremely enlarged heart and my fu- heart functioning at 6%. He felt like it was his fault. And I know um, I have to own a lot of that because I really wasn't telling him everything because I was filtering in them through, you know, what we were talking about in the last segment about, oh, well, that's not important. I'm not going to tell him that. And I'm not going to tell him that. And that's because I haven't been exercising and that's embarrassing. And mm-hmm. so I filtered them out and didn't tell him everything, even though, because I didn't realize, I think that if we tell him all those little things that don't feel important they become part of this bigger picture for our doctor. And so he can, he or she can take those little things and know if they are a piece of a puzzle that maybe we don't know about. So I would just encourage you to be completely honest. And even those things, you know, that you don't think are related, your body works in ways, unless you're in the medical field, you might not know some of the things that are connected. So I, I could, I'd love to go back and <laughs> reshare mm-hmm. with my doctor some of those earlier symptoms. That is so true. And you know, everyone is so different. Not everyone goes by the textbook. And that that's why, like you said, it's so important to share those symptoms with your doctor. And hopefully you have a really good, sounds like you have an amazing um, family doctor that really cared about you. I think that's so important to find a physician that is invested, you know, yes. in, in helping you. And you're just not another person that comes in and for the day, um, nine and 10 women experience some sort of health barrier with their health provider. And why is this Lori? You know, I think one of the reasons from my perspective, and I know a lot of people have other stories about a barrier with their health provider, but mine was that I just wasn't informed enough about what the heart symptoms could be and how serious they could be. And, you know, I heard something from an organization I'm involved in that really struck home with me. And they said the only self-exam for heart disease is awareness. Mm. And I thought that's that's so true. If we're not aware of what these symptoms are and how serious they can be, we can't self-assess. We can't know. And so the first level of that is to be aware yourself about what those symptoms can be even before we start being completely honest with our doctor. Mm -hmm. That is so good. Just having that self-awareness, knowing that, hey, I'm not feeling, something's off. I always always say to my um, fitness students, if you feel like something's off, something doesn't Mm -hmm. feel right, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you need to pursue that you know, Mm -hmm. see what you're doing. Have you changed what you're doing? If things have stayed the same, you definitely need to get that checked out. I personally think every single person needs a uh, echo test just to see that heart, you know, Mm -hmm. just to Mm -hmm. do that ultrasound of that heart, just to see what's going on. Um, Heart, heart disease. um, And you, and you said this, um, 
in your writings, it's an invisible illness. So share with us what your life has been like living with this. It is. And I, I know there's there's lots of illnesses that are invisible. And what that means is when you look at someone, you assume that they look healthy and, mm-hmm. and that they're capable and that they're able to climb that staircase or they're able to run after that dog in the street or whatever it is because they look healthy. And mm-hmm. you know, that can go for mental illness. It can go for physical illness, but It's difficult because one of the things people do when they have an invisible illness is they are trying to function in a world that's well. And so they're constantly trying to compensate, but at the same time, they're trying to prove to the world that they really are ill because we don't look like it. And so there's kind of this tightrope walk about I can function in this well world, but don't forget, even though I don't look like it, I'm not the same as you and I can't do what you can do. And maybe I need, you know, 10 or 12 hours of sleep at night or so that's the tricky balance people with invisible illness have to maintain. That is so good. You know, when you were saying about that outward appearance, um, I recall back in my early 20s, doctors would say you look as healthy as a horse. That was just something they said Mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, Even going uh, to my second open heart surgery, when I arrived, one of the nurses says, well, you you don't look sick. And I'm thinking, (laughs) well, that's good, you know, (laughs) but my heart is sick. So that that is so true. Um, Mm. How has your heart failure journey, Lori, increased your faith? It has done an amazing, I think, transformation in my faith because as the title of my book describes, I feel like I've been on this detour. I didn't see it coming. I didn't plan it. I wouldn't have chosen it. But in that, within that, being off on that side road I don't want to be on, I realized at some point that a detour is something that makes a way when there really is no way. So when you're on a road and you're traveling down and you get off on a detour, they're not taking you off the main road just for fun. They're taking you off because there's no way you you can go forward. There's a reason Mm -hmm. that you can't go forward. And so this detour I've been on is something I didn't see coming and didn't want, but it's made a way for my faith to grow deeper for me to understand and grapple with some of the questions I had. And I think I would have just bypassed that exit in life Mm -hmm. if I hadn't. Mm -hmm. Your, your book divine detour that's out, right? Anyone can purchase that. Is that true? Yes, it is. It's available on Amazon and the audio book just came out a few months ago. Okay. And so it's composed of your essays along your health journey. I think that's just fascinating. So everyone needs to get a copy. Um, Share with us some ways to manage heart failure. I mean, where are you right now with your heart? Mm -hmm. I am, it's been an up and down journey and that's kind of the nature of heart failure, but it's also a chronic progressive disease and At this point, outside of a heart transplant, there's really not a cure for heart failure. So I've been on this up and down journey. I have uh, my second device, which is an internal defibrillator and pacemaker that's specially made for heart failure patients. I have my second one. So I outlived my first one. Praise God for that. Yes, yes. And, And I'm on my second one. I take a lot of medication, but... Some of the important things are that you have to be on a really low sodium diet and as trivial, even as that sounds, it makes a huge difference. Exercise, even just walking a certain number of steps a day is very, very important. And maybe one of the things I didn't see as being so important was getting rest when you need it because your heart just gets worn out. It can't do everything it used to do. And so that rest becomes almost like another medication for you. Oh, that is so good that, you know, and and you hear some people say, well, that person may be lazy or they're always tired. 
that's one of those symptoms you need to get checked out too, right? If you're oh, yes. exhausted all the time. Um, yes. Let's take a quick break and we'll be back. And I can't wait to hear more of your story. So everyone stay tuned for more Shape by Faith. Welcome back to Shape by Faith. Laura, you, I mean, you have such an amazing story to share and you sound so peaceful. I mean, I can just hear it in your voice and you have such faith in God. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I didn't start out really doing that. I think it became something that I kind of, I grappled with it a lot. I, I started digging into some questions I had and because I had a faith when, when I got my diagnosis, I had a faith, but I didn't have one that I had stretched and used in really in the trenches yet. And so I was afraid at first to, I kind of thought maybe I would put my faith aside and come back to it later because I, I was afraid I might stretch it and break it, to be honest with you. I didn't know if it could stretch this far. So I, I, walked away from it for a little while. And then I decided I had too much history with God. I was going back. And once I decided that I could get in there and ask God the hard questions, when I could contend and, you know, lament with him, I knew that this was a faith that was the, you know, the fortified kind of faith that you can take into battle. And so that's what I did. And and any piece that I have is coming from the fact that I was able to question God and I was able to uh, be honest and, and really get in there with God. And, you know, like in the Bible, when, you know, Jacob was wrestling with God, he came away with a limp, but he also came away with a blessing. And the blessing that I came away with was this peace that I'm not, I can't control this disease Maybe the doctors can't control it, even though they're doing an amazing job. But even so, God's in control of the whole picture. And I just, I feel that now. And so I'm just grateful for that opportunity and God's patience in me while I came to that realization. Well, and and you had to do the hard work, Lori, and trust him and mm-hmm. let his peace guard your heart. I mean, once you do that and you get a taste of that, you don't want to go back. Um, so you have written this book, divine detour, and what do you want your readers to take away from your book? I really hope, and, and the book was sort of born of this diagnosis and illness, and there's some bits and pieces of my life related to my illness in there, but what I really want and what the book's really designed for is to allow someone who's on any kind of a detour, whether it's with their family or their finances or their career, that they can get in there and ask God those questions and become connected to him through that hardship instead of becoming disconnected and having that space between them and God. And so those essays are really just to kind of open up the conversation Let's talk about what's going on with this detour that you're on. This is what mine looked like. And maybe you're asking the same kind of questions. And I I think that has been one of the biggest responses to the book is that I don't have heart failure. I don't have any kind of health situation going on, but I related to what you said because I have an estranged child or, uh, you know, I lost my husband or something else terribly wrong had gone with their life path and they Mm -hmm. felt those same questions. That is so good. Now you're a community educator for women heart. So tell us about that and how you got involved with this organization. I love women heart. It was one of those things where I came to it sort of by accident. I read about it in a publication in my cardiologist's office But it is the first and only national patient-centered organization that's dedicated to serving women who are currently experiencing heart disease or who are at risk of developing heart disease. And I think the key there is it's patient-centered. It is 
you know, I, you mentioned that I was a community educator. And one of the things that we do is get together with groups of women, whether it's groups at work or book clubs or any kind of groups of women. And we distribute pamphlets and information. We have heart bags and they're called red bags of courage. And we give them those so that they can identify some of those unexpected and hidden symptoms that we were talking about earlier. And the other thing I love about Women Heart is they try to match you up. If you're a woman experiencing heart disease, they will match you up with someone who has a similar diagnosis. And you can text that person or you can call them, you can meet with them in person and you determine the level of contact that you want. Mm -hmm. But it is such a great resource to have someone else who's been there. That is so good. And everyone, everyone needs to be connected to someone that that is going through or has gone through the same thing uh, that they have. So that is so good. So it's called Women Heart and people can find that online. So is there anything else you'd like to share that's that's helped you on your heart journey? I just want to, you know, with it being American Heart Month and Uh, looking at the experience that I've been through, I would just want to encourage people to be honest with their doctor, be aware of as much as you can, not only with heart symptoms, but anything to do with your health. And keep in mind that even though heart disease seems like something that's completely preventable, it did in my, in my mind originally, um, But realize that it's actually the number one killer of women worldwide. Mm, That's right. That's right. It's so important for us to listen to the symptoms, to tell our doctors about it. And I know in my case, I had a friend actually make me go to the doctor. So maybe you're that person. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that pushes that friend in that direction. Lori, it's always, always a pleasure speaking with you. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your story today. Thank you so much, Teresa. Absolutely. And thank you for listening. I'm Teresa Rowe. Everyone have a blessed day. Bye. Thank you for listening to Shape by Faith with Teresa Rowe. Remember to visit shapebyfaith.com to find out more about workouts, the TV show, podcasts, blogs, Shape by Faith products, and much more.